Before we get into this video, I want to remind you we're giving away a Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom Switch OLED. We're also giving away a Tears of the Kingdom Collector's Edition and a pin from PAX East. Enter, head down to the link in the pin comment or the description. We're also on our road to 133,000 subscribers, so I would appreciate it if you would subscribe to the channel because, hey, Nintendo's 133 years old. All right, guys, the reviews are in, and more and more of them are going to be dropping throughout the day, but... It's time to get into some stuff, and I'm going to warn that for some people, you're going to consider some of the stuff we're going to talk about as spoilers, even though everything they talk about in these reviews was allowed by Nintendo, and there were very, very, very specific things not allowed by Nintendo. As an example, pretty much none of the reviews can really go into the story details, but if you don't care about that... Damn, is there a lot of stuff to get into. At the time of recording, this game keeps bouncing back and forth between a 96 and a 97 on Metacritic. That does mean it probably won't end up being like percentage points ahead of Tears of the Kingdom, even if it settles in at a 97, since it seems to be at the lower end of that 97 or the higher end of a 96. But we'll have to wait and see because, as I said, it keeps bouncing back and forth. I've got... I literally on screen right now, I got a 97 and a 96. As we go, it just keeps updating. So that if you just want to know the review scores, there you go. It's bouncing between a 96 and a 97 overall on Metacritic and Open Critic. So that's already extremely impressive that it's almost matching what Breath of the Wild did back in 2017. And maybe will match it when all of the reviews are taken in. That being said... Let's get into a couple categories. I split this up by the great and the bad. I didn't really do a okay because the okay aspects of the game kept changing review to review because it's going to be based a lot on personal taste. Now, before I even get into this stuff, I do want to just also remind you, reviews are subjective. There's no such thing as an objective review. They are subjective. They are about personal likes and desires. As an example, the worst review out there was a 6 out of 10. I'm not going to name the outlet because we don't need to go flame them. But basically, they didn't like Breath of the Wild, and so they don't like Tears of the Kingdom. And it's really interesting that uh, it got a 6 out of 10 from them when you already knew what this game was going to be. So having someone review a game they didn't like is weird uh, when they already knew they weren't going to like this game going in because it wasn't for them in the first place. It, it's, it's a little strange, but that is one score that potentially is holding things down. There's a couple 8 out of 10s as well, mostly because some outlets do like 4 out of 5s and don't have like 4.5s or 4.7s, right? So if they don't think it's a perfect game and they give it a 4, it could really hurt it in a way that maybe it shouldn't. That being said... Let's dive in to the great, because you guys want to know the good stuff first. So here are what pretty much every review I read agreed upon, except that 6 out of 10 review that doesn't like Breath of the Wild anyways. All right, so it improves upon Breath of the Wild in almost every possible facet. Now the story, while reviews weren't allowed to talk about it, is considered to be a massive high point for the series in most of the reviews. Most. We'll get to the bad of the story later. But most of the reviews really, really enjoyed this, the story. Ultra Hand and the other new abilities are basically genius and a lot of fun. And thanks to how the game is designed, if any one ability isn't your cup of tea, there are numerous ways, should you choose to tackle things, making this an adventure of your own imagination. Now, there are three entirely separate maps, including an underground that is the literal size of Hyrule itself. It's enthralling, expansive, and there always seems to be something new around every corner. One huge step up many reviews noted were the puzzles. Be them in the open world, the dungeons, or shrines, the puzzles are a massive step up from Breath of the Wild, reminding many of the reviewers why nobody else can really make puzzle-based obstacles that are as memorable as the Zelda team has consistently from game to game. The physics remain just as impressive in 2023 as they did in 2017, but for many of the reviewers, even more so given the new ways they can be manipulated. The enemy AI in general is considered much better than Breath of the Wild and making for a more challenging experience. They also all agree that the enemy variety is so much better in this game, but there probably won't be any complaints about that this time around. All the quality of life improvements are extremely appreciative. There's pretty much nothing 
negative said about that. Nintendo improved everything that most reviewers felt they needed to improve. Uh, most reviewers at one point or another note how Tears of the Kingdom truly made Breath of the Wild feel like a rough draft or possibly even a tech demo compared to this game. And they all say how impressive that is as most still consider Breath of the Wild one of the greatest games ever made. The dungeons are indeed a positive step forward from Breath of the Wild. You have long winding quest chains that cause the dungeons to even appear. And while they have four to five doors to unlock, sequences similar to the Divine Beast, it's actually more fun this time because the new mechanics give a much wider variety of how to solve the inherent puzzles, whereas the Divine Beasts were basically all solved in the same manner. While most of the reviews do not go in depth on boss fights, likely because of embargo restrictions, the overall conclusion is that the fights are worth the payoff. Be it overworld mini bosses, bosses in the underworld or sky, or bosses faced at the end of dungeons, Nintendo is back to making some of the most unique, interesting, and engaging boss fights the Zelda series has been known for. Hell yeah, that's all I can really say to that. All right, shrines are back. Of course, many of you guys already know this, but they are back or speculated they were back, but they're also significantly more fun this time around. They essentially took what worked, threw out what didn't, and then just cranked it to 11. So I'm really looking forward to the shrines. Uh, nobody experienced even a single bug while playing. Of course, fans are going to uncover all sorts of glitches, if they, you know, seek them out, which, of course, many fans do. But many noted that it's sad to say that this is an impressive feature because in the world of AAA games where games were at least broken only to be fixed later or in a world where so many games overpromise and underdeliver, cut features for microtransactions, Tears of the Kingdom is not only bug-free as far as every reviewer can tell, it actually over-delivers on the promises made before launch, which... That's what you want to hear, guys. This is why this is the lead contender at the moment for Game of the Year. I mean, very clearly the lead contender, the highest reviewed Game of the Year, because, hey, they did it right. And so many other games don't do it. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't critiques, because of course there are. Remember, this is all subjectives. Uh, now, the bad is that most reviews note that the performance isn't always perfect. So it's not like a rock-solid 30 FPS all the time. Digital Foundry, they're the ones that do the deepest tech analysis. Uh, in their review, they noted that it got better after a patch release that were intended for review outlets, which we all know that patch uh, released, I think, earlier this week or at the end of last week. Anyways... Uh, but basically, anytime that you use Master Hand, which is a lot, there are dips. And if you try, you can make those dips pretty bad. But most of the base gameplay outside of those moments is a rock solid 30. Still, because of the frequency of the use of that ability, Master Hand, even with FSR enabled, you can notice the chugs. And yes, Digital Foundry confirmed that patch that came out did indeed add FSR. It was not there in the review copies before that patch. So people thought they were patching people's like physical copies, and yes, that is true that it does patch that, but the digital copies that reviewers had originally didn't have the update in it, so the reason that update came out was specifically for reviews, clearly. Uh, and it did that, that patch did improve performance because the game actually was chugging before that patch in way more than just Master Hand situations. Afterwards, it seemed to only chug while using Master Hand, which is an improvement, so... Moving on. Oh, by the way, FSR did improve the visual quality as well. I watched the entire Digital Foundry review. Um, it did improve the visual quality and seems to be one of the few titles they note that FSR 1.0, which is not considered to be very good, is actually worth it. So they do think overall FSR 1.0. Tears of the Kingdom is one of the few games that proves, hey, there is specific use cases where FSR 1.0 has advantages. All right. Now, more bad on a slightly negative and a little bit positive note for some, the general takeaway on the performance is that they more than doubled the size of the world, increasing draw distance and shadow quality slightly while keeping things seamless, and still the performance isn't any worse than Breath of the Wild, which Digital Foundry said for Switch is a technical achievement in and of itself. But again, for people that wanted that rock solid 30 all the time, that is a notable thing. And performance was a consistent thing brought up by many review outlets. I don't know how many review outlets played much of the game after the patch came out. 
you know, we have no idea to know how each review outlet handled their reviews. All right. Uh, some of the reviews were kind of so-so on the story. Um, they pretty much all say it's still better than Breath of the Wild, but not, but not everyone agreed that the story was good. Again, we noted that the story was a positive in some of the reviews. Absolutely. There are many review outlets that thought it's one of the best stories in Zelda history. There are other review outlets that were like, eh, didn't really hit for me. So I just wanted to put this in both categories because it does seem like the story and this time around, like in Breath of the Wild, it's generally considered most people don't find that story to be pretty good. I'm on the outlier of thinking that it is really good, but most people generally agree the story isn't great. Uh, in this game, it seems to be a bit more divisive. And I wonder if it's a lot of, it's a bit more divisive because of um, Zelda like purists that know all the lore might be really into it, but other people that aren't might not. Because uh, it sounds like, and, and this was one review noted specifically, that there's a lot of references to like prior battles and wars and, and, and how things all played out and Zelda and Link's role in that stuff. Uh, we already know from thanks to Aonuma that one of those wars that gets brought up is the Imprisoning War. And I feel like a lot of these lore aspects referencing to prior games is really going to hit with massive Zelda enthusiasts. But the wider audience Breath of the Wild reached these references may not hit with them as well because they're not aware of those events. So I do think that that might be where some of the disconnect is, but I don't know for sure because I haven't played the damn game, right? Now, um, beyond that, some felt that while the dungeons were better than Breath of the Wild, they wanted them to be something else, for better or worse. And, and this... This seemed to be a comment that came from some of the same reviews that massively praised the story. This is why I think it might have been some Zelda purist, uh, because those that massively praised the story were probably mega Zelda fans, and those mega Zelda fans have been wanting the dungeons to go back to like Twilight Princess style dungeons, and that clearly was never going to happen because I don't know that those style dungeons really fit into what this game does. But uh, while they do still say the dungeons are better, though, so that's something. And thanks to Aonuma, we know the dungeons are themed, so they're going to be different. The boss fights are going to be vastly different between them, etc. So I'm really excited in general for this. So that basically is the gist of what I got out of the reviews. Of course, I always encourage you to go check out your favorite review outlets, your favorite YouTube reviewer, etc., etc., etc. You guys get all the extra information you need. Clearly, we were using footage from various reviews that were sourced throughout this uh this thing because hey now we have a bunch of new footage so why wouldn't we i'm not going to go into deep dive in detail of all the footage because guys the game launches in australia like maybe even before this video gets out so it's already technically going to be a public release and it releases you know tonight and guys there's no real point for me to dive into all the individual details in the footage at this point but here you guys go. We got another video coming later uh, over some interview content as well. And who the hell knows what else is going to happen today. But all I got to say is, in conclusion for me, these reviews were exactly what I thought they would be. It's, it's bouncing between a 96 and a 97 on Metacritic. And hopefully, for my, my sanity, that it, it locks in at 97 because I think this game deserves to be right up there next to Breath of the Wild. All right, guys. I'll catch you in the next video.